Anyway, there is more room up here if, if we need more room. That's the, the baptism roll because you get sprinkled a little, but I'll try and limit it. Oops, yeah. Anyway, it's so good to see so many of you. We're in the, as I said earlier, in the fourth series or fourth Sunday in our series on, on prayer, and we're using the Lord's Prayer, the one that, that Jesus gave the disciples, um, to, to look at prayer and how we should pray and what we should pray. And it's interesting that Jesus gives this prayer or teaches the disciples as a response to a question that they asked him. They, they came to him and said, teach us, teach us how to pray. And when I thought about that, I thought, man, really only adults would ask that kind of question. They, I mean, when you saw um, little Kaylee, I think Kayla on the video, I mean, they just know how to, how to talk to God. And I have a few examples here of, of prayers that kids wrote down. Um, Maybe we can put those up on the screen here real quick. It's from Larry. Dear God, maybe Cain and Abel would not kill each so much if they had their own rooms. <laughs> it works with my brother. <laughs> Larry. Hey, he, he's got it. Next, uh, do we have another one? We read, thus Edison made light, but in Sunday school they said, you did it. So I bet he stole your idea. <laughs> Sincerely, Donna. Huh? Then, dear God, if you watch in church on Sunday, I will show you my new shoes. Nikki, oh. See, what I love about that is they just talk to God. I mean, there's no formula or, you know, you just, you just come to God and share with Him what's, what's on your heart. But the disciples needed help, and maybe so do we. And so Jesus gave them the, the Lord's Prayer as, a, as an example of things that that we need to bring before him, that we need to say to him, that we need to ask of him. And so three weeks ago, we started with, um, with the, the first phrase of the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, and um, we talked about what it means that, that God is our, our Father. Um, then the week later, we talked about um, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, the whole point of submitting to him and to his will for our lives. And then last week, we talked about him providing our daily needs. Give us today our daily bread and the peace that should come and hopefully comes from knowing that God cares and knows and wants to and will provide for us. So today we come to, to the next part um, where we ask, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Or in another translation it says, um, forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. Have you ever been in a situation where you really desperately, urgently needed and longed for someone else's forgiveness besides God? Just another person where you just knew in your heart you needed that person's forgiveness and, and grace and mercy? Anybody? Anybody besides me? One, one situation in my life that stands out when I, when I think about that is a Situation um, when I was in, in Bible college. I was in, went to Bible college in South Carolina and it was my senior year in Bible college. And I was taking a class on the book of Romans. And from the moment you stepped on campus as a, as a freshman or whenever you came, you heard about the Romans paper your senior year. It was like a, a huge deal. And so for four years you're dreading this and finally you're there, you're taking the class. And, and towards the end of the class, um, towards the end of the semester, we were supposed to hand in a paper, the big Romans paper. It was supposed to be a word study. So you pick one word out of the whole book of Romans, some big theological word like propitiation, you know, and nobody knows what it means, and I don't know, and I've written a big paper about it. But so you, you pick a big word, and then you're supposed to explain what that word means. And, and so a 30-page paper on one word. So what you do is you, you pick the word, and you pick the most difficult, if, if you're really silly, and, and then you, um, you study that word in, in its original Hebrew or Greek, Greek meaning, and then what did the equivalent word mean in Hebrew, and in like super ancient times, how did people use that word, and what did it entail, and what does it mean in the marketplace, and in a theological setting, and in a social setting, and, and what did Paul mean with it in this letter, and what does it mean in the context of the whole New Testament, in the context of the, of the whole Bible, and, and then what does it mean for me today? And so 30 pages on one word. 
And um, so at the time, I was, a, I was a senior. I was about to graduate. I was on a full scholarship at the school and, and was married. We had a, a, a daughter already. Clara had been born. And I was working 40 hours, taking a full load in school. And it was just a lot going on. And you might guess where this is going. I, I just didn't find the time to get this done. And the deadline came closer and closer. And at some point, I got my hand on a paper that somebody had written on that same word. <laughs> Well, would you believe, a few years earlier, his name was Pete, Pete the Pistol, uh, we called him. I remember him very, very well. And it was okay for us to maybe look at someone else's paper. And the professor said, you know, if you don't know what this is supposed to look like, have a look at one. And I mean, he, he trusted us, so I got my hands on Pete's paper, Pete Murphy. <laughs> I don't know if he even knows this, but um, he does now, if he, if he watches YouTube. <laughs> but... Uh, so the deadline came closer. I didn't get around to it, and I, I was really busy. I didn't spend the time with God that I should have, so my conscience wasn't as sharp as it should have been. And, and at some point, the, the idea took root that, listen, you have, a, you have a great paper. I mean, I couldn't say it any better than Pete Murphy did. Really, I mean, he got an A for it. Why reinvent the wheel and you start to, you know... To, you, you know, you start to say, Man, I, you know, why, why do this again? You know, I've read it, I understand it, I get it, this is great, you know, I agree with this. And you start to rationalize. And so at some point, it was impossible for me to get it done. So I, I wait, made, went ahead and made plans to, to just do it. I, I, I made a copy before I gave it back. I retyped it and put my name on it. And I was a senior in Bible college. I was ready to go into seminary the next semester. had a scholarship for seminary, too. So somebody was actually paying for me, plagiarizing. And, uh, and there were... Yeah, I did it. I, I copied it the night before. I just could not sleep. I was so restless. It was just going through. How could you do that? Well, but I have to now. And... And at some point, I just, I just couldn't hold it in anymore. It was in the middle of the night. I rolled over. I woke up my wife and said, Honey, I, I had to tell you something. This is what, what I was about to do. And you know, I told her the whole story of how, how I got to the point, And it was due the next morning. And so obviously, now that I had told her, there was no way I was going to go through with this. And, and I knew I had to talk to my professor the next morning. And he was a great professor. I really liked him. He was probably one of my favorite professors. But he was also very... If somebody handed in something late, there was a consequence to that. And it was just, you know, I did, we deserved that. It was late, well, deduction. And he had the freedom, and I knew that, to say, well, you didn't hand it in. This is towards the end of the semester. Grades are being done. You, you're failing this class, which would have meant you're not graduating. Then I have to explain that to the scholarship people and why I'm not going into seminary the next semester. And there were huge implications, possibly. To this, and so the next morning, I, I remember walking up to his door and knocking. I was shaking in my boots. I was I was fearful, and I he, I came in. I sat down in his armchair and explained to him what I what I had been about to do, and that I wasn't going to hand in the paper. And I said, I, I understand what you know. You have freedom to decide what the consequences are, and I'm I'm ready to accept those and to deal with those and. And knew full well what that could mean. And I'm, I'll never forget, he got out of his chair. It was a long, skinny guy, and old. <laughs> he came over, walked over to me, and held his hand out and said, I congratulate you, young man, on your victory. And he said, hand in the paper whenever you get ready. If it's after the semester, just hand it in when you got it. There won't be any deductions. I think you've learned more through this process than you will from writing this paper. You know what that was? That was grace in action. That was mercy. That was, he gave me something I didn't deserve. I deserved to suffer a consequence. But he gave me mercy. And I tell you, as fearful as I left, as I went to his office, when I left that office, I was like walking on air. I was floating out of there. There was a, a freedom all of a sudden, that just was overwhelming, and I remember it well to this day. Have you ever experienced that, that, that freedom that comes from when somebody 
forgives you, when, when that burden that you've been carrying and that fear that comes with it was all of a sudden just oh, lifted and taken away and gone. And we've heard it described a few times here in this video before this freedom, this weight that was lifted. Have you experienced that? I tell you, if you haven't, I advise you go out today and you seriously tick somebody really badly off just so you can go and ask for forgiveness so you can experience the freedom that comes from that. Now, that probably won't work if you set it up like that, but, but you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just something I hope and wish you have or will experience. And maybe you're in the place right now where you're waiting for that experience that experience where you're waiting for that forgiveness and maybe it's not there maybe it seems out of reach maybe the person you need it from isn't even talking to you so what do you do with what do you do with that but even if we have experienced it and i have i have experienced it from from god i've experienced it from other people yet i find it extremely difficult to extend that to other people. Do you? I mean, forgiveness does not come natural, does it? In fact, I think it's supernatural because it's not something that we, we tend to do. And so Jesus instructs us to, to pray and ask God to forgive us our debts in the same way that we forgive our debtors. And I read that and I say, Jesus, why would I want to pray that now? No, yes, forgive. Okay, the first part I get. You know, forgive me my debt. I, I like that idea, do you? Anybody with me on that? Love that idea. But to make that conditional on me, forgiving others? Now, where did that come from? That's kind of out of left field. I, why would I want to pray that? You know, I, I, I deserve forgiveness. I'm a pretty good guy. I, I really deserve someone else's mercy and God's mercy and forgiveness. But, but Mary did that and, and she said that about me. And I mean, that really hurt Mary and... And I think God's wrath should come down on you, and I should be the agent of who should administer that wrath. I mean, that's just right, right? So God, yeah, forgive me, but not Mary, and not me. Forgive Mary? Why, why, why would we pray that? And why does it work that way? See, forgiveness, the whole topic of forgiveness is absolutely central to the whole message of this book. It starts in the Old Testament where, where God set up a sacrificial system for the nation of, of Israel where they had to, had to acknowledge their sins and actually kill an animal as a sacrifice to atone for their sin. It was a way to, to show them you, you need forgiveness. And that was only to set up Jesus who would be the ultimate sacrifice. And then all of the New Testament is about forgiveness that God offers through his son. So it's central to this, to this book. And I just want to tell you up front, it's, it's a difficult topic for me, and, and we will only scratch the surface this morning. But it's an incredibly important, important topic. And it's, it's hard. It's hard for me. And I bet if you're honest, it's hard for you. Because forgiving somebody else or asking for forgiveness takes humility it takes the realization that you are in need of forgiveness which means you've done something wrong that needs forgiveness and again that takes humility and that's hard for me is is it hard for you it's hard for me so as i looked at this i i had two questions for god and i'm, I'm going to start the the other way around one question is why do i need to forgive others What's the need for me to forgive others? And then why do I need God's forgiveness? What's so bad and so wrong in my life that I need and am so bad in need of forgiveness that that's all the Bible really talks about? So why do I need to forgive others? Well, first of all, we need to define forgiveness. Forgiveness really, when, when it comes down to it, means that I'm willing to suffer the negative consequences of someone else's bad decision. That really, that's really what it means. That I'm willing to say, okay, you know what? You did this, but I'm willing to suffer the consequences of that action and move on and not hold it against you. That's really what, what forgiveness means. So why do I need to do that to other people? Well, for one thing, forgiving others, and this is really odd, but forgiving others 
is essentially good for me. Is essentially good for me and my heart. I did some research on the whole topic of forgiveness. Google is a great sermon preparatory tool. Um, so I googled forgiveness and research on forgiveness, and you wouldn't believe there is a ton of what we would call secular research out there on forgiveness. Secular meaning it's not based on, on any religious foundation or, or biblical truths. It's just people who don't necessarily believe in God or Jesus just studying the topic of forgiveness and the effect it has on forgivers and the forgiven and, and what it does to people. And actually, Duke University has a, a whole... Um, Forgiveness Research Institute, so does Stanford University. And here's a, a result that Duke University came up, up with after years and years of research and studying this. They came up with the fact that people that forgive or are forgiven have a significant reduction in chronic pains, especially back pain, which is kind of weird. But, but there's a clear scientific result of their research, and it leads to significantly less depression in the lives of those people. So there's physical results based on a biblical truth, which is really, really cool. Then there's a, a research institute at Stanford University, Dr. Thorensen, some Norwegian dude, is like the super expert on this. And he you know, has had millions of dollars poured into his research and has spent years of his life studying this. And this is a quote out of, out of the results that he has come up with so far. And this is what Dr. Sorensen says. He says, in any relationship that we have studied in our research, in any relationship, there can't be peace and reconciliation if there isn't forgiveness. In any relationship, there cannot be peace and reconciliation if there isn't forgiveness. And he needed millions of dollars and years to come up with that when he could have just opened the Bible that wrote about it 2,000 years ago. You know, that, that, that money could have been spent elsewhere. Now, I'm glad he came up with that because it is right. There cannot be peace and reconciliation in any relationship unless there is forgiveness. There cannot be peace between you and another human being. There cannot be peace between you and God unless there is forgiveness. And I, I should have sent this, this um, passage to Dr. Thornton years ago, but 2 Corinthians 5.19 says this, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, so bringing us back into a relationship with him, no longer counting people's sins against them, forgiving them. This is the wonderful message he has given us to tell others, but nobody told Dr. Thornton. <laughs> So it is good for us to forgive others. It is also freeing for us to receive forgiveness. Doug, I was so set free by Dr. Bedell's forgiveness of what I was about to do, his grace and mercy that he extended to me. It frees both the forgiver and the forgiven. Now, I want to tell you a story. I like telling stories. I don't know if you noticed, but... I have a really good friend in, uh, out on the East Coast in South Carolina. His name is Theron. And uh, he gave me permission to share this story. I had a long phone conversation with him this week to freshen up my memory of his story. He, uh, he had a brother who was 11 years older than he was. And from the earliest time in his life that Theron can remember, literally, literally laying on a changing table when he was two or two and a half. The earliest memories he has are of his brother, his older brother, abusing him sexually. This went on for years and years and didn't stop until Theron was a freshman in high school when his brother joined the Marines after college. For years and years he was taken advantage of on a definitely weekly, often daily basis. He told me of a routine that he went through mechanically, when he got up Saturday mornings, he would mechanically walk to his brother's room, only to be expected to do certain things, and his brother doing things to him for years. And then after this procedure would be over, his brother would sit him down on his lap and read some book about a rabbit to him. For years and years and years. It was never talked about. And his, his father eventually found out about it after, when he was in college. 
this, this older brother was in college and didn't allow him back in the house. And, but it was never talked about. This same brother, interestingly enough, was really family-oriented, would, would call Theron every year on his birthday. But this was never brought up. Besides those phone calls, there was no conversation, no relationship at all. <laughs> Can't imagine why. And then years later, Theron found Christ, started following Christ, found forgiveness for his own guilt and the shame that he had carried around with him for years and years and years, thinking it might have been his fault and received forgiveness for that. And at some point in, in his adult life, he felt that he had offended his sister-in-law. So for two years, he had this burden he carried around. Man, I've offended her, I've offended her, and she's holding this against me. And eventually, he felt convicted to call his sister-in-law and called her up and said, Hey, I'm, I've been thinking about this and what I said back then. And she said, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. But, but for him, it was so freeing to, to, to let her know that, that he had been carrying this around with her. And all of a sudden, he, said, he realized, Man, if, if I felt so bad for two years having said something that didn't even register with her, how much guilt must my brother carry around with him for decades now, for decades, for what he did to me? And he felt so convicted to call his brother and tell him he had already forgiven his brother in his heart, but he had never voiced that to him. And so out of the blue, he calls him up the first time in decades he initiated contact with him and just called him up. I don't remember his name. Let's just call him Bob. And Theron called him up and said, hey, Bob, it's Theron. And I just want to let you know that I have, I have found Jesus and I have a relationship with him and I have found just freedom and forgiveness in, in my relationship with him and just awesome to walk in that freedom. And I just want you to know, Bob, that, that I have forgiven you for what you have done to me all those years. And I don't hold it against you and I'm willing to live with the consequences of that and I love you. And his brother didn't respond. He just said, okay, thank you. That's all he said on the phone. And conversation ended there. And Theron just knew he had done the right thing. And just, there was just a sense of peace and, and freedom from just having released that. And the next day, Bob's wife, they had been married for years and years. And, and Bob, in his adult life, pretty much, he, he had to leave the Marines. He became very dysfunctional, just depression and, and just big personality and mental health issues. And he couldn't work, and the marriage was dysfunctional, and just a really, really bad spot in life. And his wife called Theron the next day, and, and she said this, Theron, I have no idea what you talked to Bob about yesterday. He won't tell me. And he had, by the way, never told his wife about this, this part of his past. And she said, I don't have no idea what you talked about. But when he got off that phone, it's like he was a new man. The depression has lifted. The, the, the mental issues, the symptoms aren't there. And this, I mean, this was just the next day. And she said, I have a new man in the house. And their relationship was, was restored. Obviously, there was healing that took place immediately as a result of this, this tremendous amount of guilt that Bob had carried around with him that was all of a sudden lifted off. And, and Theron and Bob's relationship was restored. And about a week later, Theron and his wife drove up to see his brother, and he shared his whole story of finding Christ with him. And within a year, Bob died of a, of a sudden blood clot but he had experienced forgiveness. Forgiving frees us and it frees the forgiven. And then we, we, we're supposed, we need to forgive other people because God tells us, as his followers, he tells us and he calls us to forgive others because of the forgiveness we have received from him. And and the disciples, Peter, struggled with this also. He, he came to Jesus at one point and said, Jesus, now tell me this whole forgiveness thing. How often do I have to forgive somebody? <laughs> Can you relate with that? I mean, there's got to be a limit, right? I mean, you forgive and forgive and forgive. They don't get it. They do it and they do it. You forgive and you forgive. It's got to run out sometime. And, and Peter came to Jesus and actually suggested an answer, which is really cool. I think he said, Jesus, what do you think? Seven sound reasonable? Seven times? Seven, seven, seven sounds good to me. What about you, Jesus? And Jesus looked at him and said, well... 
I know it sounds good to you, Peter, but what about 70 times 7? So Peter goes, 70 times 7, that's, how much is that? Any math genius here? 100 and something? I don't know. It's a lot more so. He said, okay, now let's keep track. Okay, I've already forgiven 22 times. 23, 24, 25. See, but that's not what Jesus was talking about. The, the saying that he used, you know, say 70 times 7, really meant uh, infinite amount of times. I'm, I'm sorry, Peter. There is no end to forgiving. And Peter went, like, oh, I knew you'd say that. You know, there's no end to the forgiveness that Jesus expects from us. And you know why? Because there is no end to his forgiveness for us. And then Jesus goes on. Right after this conversation, he, he uses an illustration to explain to Peter what this, what this forgiveness looks like. And he, he, Jesus liked telling stories too, by the way. He told stories all the time. And this story that he told Peter or the, and the disciples say isn't necessarily a story that, that happened. It's a, it's a parable. It's a, an example, an illustration. And he tells him the story of a king who um, had a servant who owed him a lot of money. It's, he describes it as, as 10,000 talents. And talents was a currency back there. But today, I mean, 10,000 talents, even back then, would have exceeded a king's wealth. It would have exceeded the currency available in a certain country at the time. So what Jesus is saying, this servant owed the king more than we can even fathom, more than anybody, especially a servant, could ever repay. This debt was insurmountable. That's what Jesus is saying. So the king summons this servant and brings him in and says, Dude, you owe me this. When am I going to get it? Well, it's insurmountable. He'll never be able to pay it back. And so the king says, Well, justice needs to be done, right? If somebody owes you something, you owe some. You've got to, I, you know, we have a house mortgage. I can go into a, to, to Wells Fargo and say, Hey, sorry. You know, well, they, they, they're going to demand justice. This king demanded justice, and the guy couldn't pay back, so the king says, well, you know what? If you can't pay back, I'm going to take you. I'm going to take everything you own. I'm going to take your wife. I'm going to take your children. I'm going to sell them into slavery and you know, get back whatever I, I can. This is going to consume your whole life. I'm taking everything from you. And the servant fell on his knees and, and begged for mercy and said, I can never do this. Please don't do this. Don't do this. Don't be just. Don't do what is fair. Don't give me or don't do what I deserve. Give me mercy. And he's pleading for his life, pleading for the life of his wife and his children. And somehow the king is moved and says, Okay, okay, I have mercy. And you know what? Not only do I forgive some of it, it's, it's erased. It's erased. You don't owe me anything. Just go. You're free. Can you imagine somebody doing that to you? Having that kind of debt, that kind of guilt hanging over you and somebody saying it's, it's erased. So he walks out. and I mean, I can only try to fathom the, 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 the freedom that he must have felt, probably a little bigger than what I felt about my Romans paper. But he, he walks out just having experienced freedom and he runs into another servant who owes him just a tiny little fraction of what he owed the king. And you would think he just wraps his arms around him and dances and says, dude, ruffles his hair and says, forget about it, forget about it. This is what just happened to me, man. Don't worry about it. But you know what he does in the story that Jesus tells? He grabs the guy and says, Dude, you owe me something. I need it. He demands justice. He can't pay. He has him thrown in jail because of what he owed him. See, he received grace, but he wasn't willing to give it himself. And so the king hears about that. And the king says, Well, well wait a second, man. <laughs> if, if, if that's how you want to operate, that, that's how we can operate. And and he has him thrown in jail for, for what he owed the king. See, and I, I, that's, that's the principle we're talking about here, that God forgives the way we forgive. And I want to illustrate that to you a little differently here quickly. Let's say this is a wall dividing two rooms. See, the, the, the king was over here demanding justice. He was in the room of, of justice, demanding justice be done to the servant who, who owed him. And he was right. Yes, he owed him. And in this room where justice is being done, he can demand that. But then through the pleading and the begging and the asking for forgiveness, the king was moved. And he, he takes the servant over into the, 
the room of grace where justice has no room. This is where, where grace is received and grace is given. And so over here, the servant who had this unsurmountable debt and you know, people walk through this life with unbelievable guilt and debt towards God. And we try to shake it and we just can't. And people point their fingers at us over here and, and judge us. And, and God says, no, 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 come over here. Come over here. See, God, God is just, but he also his grace. And that's why he provides this room. And we come in with this huge chunk of guilt that's chained to our ankles and we can barely make it and we, we have this huge weight on our shoulders and we, we just barely make it and, and really we really want to hide it but it's so big everybody's got to see it and judge me according to it but you come into this room of grace where, where Jesus just says let me take that off let me just take that off forget about this just be with me in this room of grace. Receive and give grace. And so this is where the servant is. But then he, he sees this other guy who owes him. And, and he decides to keep the benefits of this room. But then <laughs> want the benefit of this room of demanding justice. And he goes into the room of justice and demands justice to be done. But see, here's the point. You can't live and operate in the room of justice and demand justice for yourself but want to receive grace. There is, there is no grace in the room of justice. In the room of justice, you can request justice to be done, but justice will be applied to you. In the, in the room of justice, you can condemn, but you will be condemned. And here you can judge, but you will be judged. But if you walk into the room of grace, there is no pointing fingers. There is no condemnation. There is no judgment. There is... Forgiveness and grace. But in this room, you, you receive and give grace. You, you can't have it both ways. You can't, can't be on both sides of the fence. God operates over here. We operate over here. If we decide we want to be here, then God says, okay, if you want to operate here, then we'll operate here. You will be forgiven the way you forgive others. So the question is, what room are you in currently? Are you in a room where you feel the guilt, where you feel the accusations, where you accuse and point fingers at others, where you condemn and, and are condemned? Or, or are you in the room of, of grace where you receive forgiveness, but where you extend forgiveness? And I want to be honest with you. Judgment and revenge, which is this realm over here, feels good. And then, I mean, have you ever wanting to just get back at somebody so bad and that was just so consuming? You think, man, once I get back, I'm just going to feel so good. I used to play competitive soccer on a fairly high level in, in Germany. And I had a game and I came in and I, I was really tearing it up now in all humility. I was scoring it well. I had scored three goals already and... I went into the box and they took me down. We got a penalty and the guy was really upset. I might have fallen a little easily, but, but it was a clear penalty. So the guy comes up and he was in my face. And then he goes and spits in my face. The, the green stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I, if you've ever been spit at, it's, it's not fun. It's, really, it's kind of like it comes from the depth of hate. And, it, uh, and that's what it does to you. It did to me. And I remember, and I was actually trying to walk with Jesus at the time, but I remember, <laughs> seriously, I remember having, in the heat of the battle, having the, the clearness of mind to look around where the sideline judge was and the, and the center ref. And if they were looking, they weren't. And I gave it right back to him, just spit right back. And in the moment, I know, I know, I wasn't the pastor at the time. <laughs> but, uh, I did, and you know what? In that moment, that felt like just the heck got him back. But within seconds, and then after the game, man, I was just, it felt horrible. Revenge and justice is not what it's wrapped up to be. You know the story of, of the Count of Monte Cristo? 
Anybody know the story? If you don't, get the movie. It's a really good, fairly new movie, a few years old, about that. Count of Monte Cristo, he was a dude who got totally ripped off by some friends, betrayed, and then they, they, they set him up. He was put to jail, actually like a dungeon, and then the guy that did frame him also took his fiance, the love of his life, and in jail he devised this plan. And he actually made it out. He found there's a tremendous treasure, and he created this new personality, and everything was so that he could get back. He had this incredible plan of getting back into these people's lives and he had altered his, his, his uh, looks and, and so he got back into these lives to get back at every single one of them and it consumed his whole life and the idea was that once I'm, I'm got back and I got justice, oh, I'm going to be free. But you know what? It doesn't work that way. When he got done, was nothing but emptiness. Nothing but emptiness. Freedom will never come in the room of justice. Freedom will only ever come in the room of grace, where you receive it and where you give it. <coughs> so are you ready for that? Are you willing to step over there? Then some of you might say, well, do I really need to be over there? I mean, I, I haven't done anything that outrageous. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't embezzled millions of dollars. I haven't, you know, committed adultery. I'm a decent guy. I do the right thing. Why, why is forgiveness from God such a necessity? What, what is there to forgive? Come on, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a decent dude. You know, and, and I was too. I, I haven't killed somebody. I, I, I've been faithful. I've, I've never stolen more than a few Deutschmarks out of my mom's wallet when I was a kid. I mean, and that wasn't worth much, you know. And I mean, wh what's there so, so bad? Well, you see, God has a different economy in how he counts sin, how he counts debt. See, the Bible says we look... We look at the outside. We look at what a man does and says, but God looks at the heart. And, and Jesus talks about that in, in the Sermon on the Mount where he expounds on the Ten Commandments. You know, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you, know, you shall not envy, not steal. And he says, you know what? Yeah, that's, that's the law, but you know what? God looks at the heart, and if you get angry at your brother, you've already committed murder in your heart. So in God's economy, any, anybody's gotten angry recently? This morning, me, yes. You're going overtime, Christian. I'm angry. Careful. <laughs> anger. <laughs> anger in God's economy is already like murder committed. You say, well, I've always been faithful to my wife. Well, Jesus says, expounding on that, on that command, says, well, if you as much as look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And, and it's interesting that he only talks about men in that context, <laughs> not, not women, but uh, we'll talk about that another day. But, uh, <laughs> okay, guys, who has not looked at a woman lustfully that wasn't your wife? I mean, hello? You've already committed adultery. In God's economy, we are guilty and there is consequences in God's economy and God is just he demands justice to be done and you know when justice was done when Jesus went on the cross we might think what did I do so bad well you know what we did we put Jesus on that cross what we did led to Jesus on the cross for you and for me and because of that so God is just, but Jesus met the requirement of justice to be done for us. You know what I call that? I call that God's divine bailout plan. This is God's bailout plan for us. And trust me, it's a lot more effective than Obama's. <laughs> I, wanna, I, wanna get, I don't want to get political at all. And, and I have no opinion on this bailout plan, but you know what happened with this? Here's, here's a, here are guys who made unbelievable mistakes. Financially, economically, they've driven companies into the pits, and it's insurmountable. They cannot. Can, can any of them get, get these ships righted again economically? They cannot. So what did they have to do? They had to admit, they had to come to the realization, we have really sunk this one. They had to go to a higher authority and grovel and beg for forgiveness 
Help us. We cannot make it on our own. And then that higher authority, whether this is right or not, is a totally different issue, but it's a great illustration, said, okay, we're going to be extremely gracious with you beyond what you deserve. And we're going to try and make this right. And this is what God has done for us. This is what he has done. He says, you don't deserve this. And I'm just, but you know what? Justice has been done. And I offer you this bailout plan. But just like these CEOs have to accept it, they actually are going to have to take these checks or whatever they're going to get and deposit them for them to have any chance of getting this right. And in the same way, God says, okay, I've, I've done it. This isn't just. This isn't fair. This is grace. And I extend it to you. But you have to accept it. You have to walk through the door from justice to grace, the door that Jesus kicked in on the cross. You have to walk through that door. But it's open. And it's open to you. So the question is, is justice too important to you to receive grace? Because you can't be here and experience grace. And I love justice. I love revenge. But you know, the freedom that I have experienced in the room of grace far outweighs any temporary satisfaction that justice can bring. So where are you going to be? What room are you going to step in? Colossians 1.22 says this, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusations. Once you walk through that door and you accept that offer of grace, that divine bailout plan, it doesn't matter what happens after that. You will not be Accused. There is no more accusations. There's only freedom. Only freedom. 